<clears throat> it's been a great privilege to be able to come and um, come to these wonderful religion and life this year. It's one as a um, and with Brad's calling, we've had that invitation. But I have to say, the spe speakers have all been exceptional. But I really come to hear the choir, so that was beautiful. Thank you so much. I love the choir. It's my privilege today to introduce to you the man of my dreams, my best friend, the father of our eight children, and the grandfather of our 12 and a half little grand darlings, my mission companion, and most importantly, my eternal companion. Brad Johnson was born and raised here in Logan, and I think as kids we were rolling Easter eggs and sledding down Old Main Hill probably together and didn't even know it. <laughs> and so we were Aggies from the time we were born, but I have to say I had to be converted. Brad was an Aggie through and through, and um, he converted me. I won't tell you where I was attending school when we got engaged, but I did finish at Utah State. <laughs> He earned his bachelor's degree in business administration here. Um, our children are scattered all over the country and beyond, and I say this is because we lived all over the country for 33 years. We, we graduated and left Utah and came and, and had the wonderful chance to, uh, to retire back here, and we're so happy to be back. Brad got his MBA and ended up working as a um, chief financial um, officer and administrator for different retailers throughout around the country in Minnesota, Boston, Wisconsin, Maine, and Seattle. And you might think, did he get fired that many times? But do you know what? It was just the opposite. He was um, highly sought after um, by many companies. He has been a wonderful provider for our family. He currently teaches a corporate finance class at Utah State, and I think he absolutely loves it. I, he's just ha tickled to do it. He's, he really enjoys it. As I was considering what I might tell you about my husband, I shot out an email to our eight children, and I asked them to just give me a one or two word description of their dad. And here are some of the things they said. He's a great mentor, very goal-oriented, tall, <laughs> Purposeful, honest, kind, generous, that was three words, smart, driven, and devoted to the Lord. And I thought that was a great compliment from his children. I'm going to stop there so he doesn't get too prideful, though. <laughs> I wanted to share just a couple of things I've been taught by Brad's example in my life. When you live with someone for 40 years, you get to know them pretty well. And I have learned so much with and from my husband. I learned early on that Brad was truly a goal setter. Unlike me, who will often set a goal, and I'll be really happy if I get through a week or a month, he never sets a goal that he doesn't stick with. One year, his goal was to learn to play the piano. And he would had a little music with an instrument as a kid, but he practiced faithfully every day for fi at least 15 minutes for that year. And he learned just about all the simplified hymns on his own. And I didn't even get to help him. It was quite amazing. I don't know too many people who commit um, going off desserts or sweets for an entire year and actually stick with it. But Brad has done that many times. And when he got to the end of the year, I'd say, OK, what do you want me to make you? And he'd say, I feel so good. I think I'm going to do it for another year. <laughs> That's the kind of self-discipline that he has developed. Maybe he was born with it. I don't know. Brad has always been a lover of learning. He's an avid reader and has an amazing memory to remember the things that he reads. You never want to play Trivial Pursuit with him, though, because he remembers facts and dates like no, no one I know. This is a wonderful gift that he has been given. He loves to travel, and I think it's because it's such a great way to learn. I've never, I have been so blessed by this because I was truly a homebody, and I have learned that I can love traveling, too. And in fact, I used to call it climb every mountain. <clears throat> One of his favorite things is traveling with his family. But unlike many tourists, he loves to have a good challenge. And so we have this family joke that our kids had to try out for family vacations. <laughs> he knew that in order for them to enjoy the adventure, that they had to be in pretty good shape. And so he would drop a contract with them. And they would have to be able to run so many miles 
earn so much money, write a report about a place that we were going to visit. And I have to say that he probably ran 50 miles to their five because he would help each one of them and taught them the value of starting small and, and eventually being able to do hard things. And I think they really did enjoy those vacations because they, they could hike. <clears throat> It's no surprise to me the topic that Brad chose to share with you today because he lives it. Most of all, I am grateful for Brad's love and devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ and his church. He has always been willing to serve wherever he's called, and he does it with joy, and he does it with his heart, mind, and strength. It's, a, it's been an um, inspiration to see him in his callings. Recently, we had a life-changing experience serving side-by-side -side for three years as he presided over the Pennsylvania-Pittsburgh mission. We both experienced over and over again that in the strength of the Lord, you can do far more than you can ever do on your own. I leave you my testimony that that is true and that our Savior is our Redeemer, our Savior, our strength. And I say that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, that, uh, that sounded a little bit like a eulogy. <laughs> and that makes me just a little nervous to follow that introduction. Now, I'm not going to stand at the podium. I'm just a, a little bit too restless to stand there. And I am excited to be here. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak to this group. Rosie and I have come to many religion in life presentations over the last year and it was real comfortable to sit in that chair but this is just a little different experience but i'm thankful that i get a chance to share with you some things that have blessed uh, my life now that's not the slide i want to come up here let's see if this will get get uh, this one up. That's a good slide. That's uh, one of our mission, one of the two times we had all of our missionaries together and uh, in Pennsylvania. I want to begin today by, uh, with a quote from President Nelson. And before I do that, let me tell you just a quick story, an experience that Sister Johnson and I had with President Nelson about five years ago, we were at the MTC for the new mission president's training seminar. And at that seminar, we had five days of being taught by the first presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve. It was a wonderful experience. But at the beginning of that seminar, I discovered a flavor of ice cream from the BYU Creamery that was creating some problems. And it was a problem because I caught myself sometimes thinking about ice cream instead of what was being taught. Well, by the last day of the seminar, uh, <clears throat> I had uh, I figured out that in this great big room where we ate our meals, I figured out where the, uh, the ice cream freezer was and that there were some benefits of sitting right next to the ice cream freezer. <laughs> so we went to lunch the last day, just went straight to the table, sat down, and about a minute later, then Elder Nelson, now President Nelson, walked up and said to me, can I sit by you? And we said, well, of course, that'd be great. We get to have lunch with an apostle. And it was a memorable lunch. But I got to tell you, there was just this side to me that was struggling with it. Because I had been thinking all morning about Graham Canyon ice cream. And I also thought about how President Nelson's a world-renowned heart surgeon. He has this legendary good health. One of my nephews told me that uh, when they had two apostles come to their mission, one of them would eat anything they put in front of him. The other was President Nelson, and President Nelson wouldn't touch something that was unhealthy. So I'm thinking about that, and I have this vision of my last shot at Graham Canyon ice cream evaporating right there. <laughs> and then something wonderful happened. Elder Nelson finished his lunch, pushed back his chair, walked over to the freezer, grabbed some roasted almond fudge ice cream, came back, smiled, and said, it's a good idea to sit near the ice cream freezer. <laughs> 
So I wrote that in my journal, and I've done that for the last five years. Uh, let's go to something far more important to that than his counsel on ice cream. Uh, President Nelson said, now is the time to align our goals with God's goals. And President Monson said, without a goal, there can be no real success. Now, I love this last one from President Ballard. This comes from Preach My Gospel. Some of you ex-missionaries will recognize this quote. President Ballard says, when one learns to master the principles of setting a goal, he will then be able to make a great difference in the results he attains in this life. Now, I've seen that happen in my life over and over, and it's changed the richness of my life. And let me tell you how that happened. When I was in high school, and I'm going to take you back more than four decades, uh, when I was at Logan High School, we used to sometimes have a speaker that would come and do an assembly. All of the student body would come to the, uh, to the auditorium, and you, we'd get a speaker, and usually they were kind of boring. But we had a speaker this time who was anything but boring. His name was John Goddard, and he was an internationally recognized explorer and adventurer. He'd been written about in National Geographic and Life magazine, and he had done some remarkable things. He was the first and the only man that's ever kayaked the whole length, uh, length of the Nile and the Congo rivers. He'd climbed all kinds of mountains, been to 100 plus different countries, and he told us about some of these adventures. He caught me. I was, I was uh, captivated by John's story. And uh, <clears throat> John, John then told us how he was able to do all of these things. He said when he was 15 years old, he sat down and wrote down the things he wanted to accomplish in life, all of the goals he wanted to do. He ended up with 127 things, and he called it his life list. And let me share with you some things he had on that life list. He wanted to climb Mount Everest, Mount Rainier, Mount Kilimanjaro, the Matterhorn. He wanted to photograph Victoria, Yosemite, and Niagara Falls. He wanted to retrace the travels of Marco Polo and Alexander the Great, explore the Nile, Amazon, and Congo rivers, to visit the Eiffel Tower, the Taj Mahal, the North and South Poles, play Claire de Lune on the piano, and this next one I especially love. He wanted to light a match with a 22. <laughs> Can't you see a 15-year-old boy making that one of his life goals? John also wanted to go on a mission, raise a family, read the Bible, go to the moon, live to the 21st century. Again, that's just a, a, a few of those 127 goals. And John explained to us that he was just a regular 15-year-old, but he had he knew how to dream big, and he knew how to discipline himself, set a goal, and go after it. And when John was at Logan High School, he was 48 years old and had accomplished 103 of those 127 goals. Well, that presentation had a lasting impact on me. And I thought, what could I do with my life if I was willing to set some goals? And since that time, that has driven much of what I have done. And let me just share with you a few goals that, that uh, have changed my life. Anybody recognize that mountain? Now, you recognize it from Disneyland probably, right? <laughs> That's the Matterhorn in Switzerland. And it is one of the iconic and most beautiful peaks in the world. In 1977, when I finished my mission, my mom and dad came over and picked me up. I was served in France and Switzerland. They picked me up, we did a little touring, and one of the places we went was Zermatt, which is the little village down at the base of the Matterhorn. 
and we took a, a cable car up to, the, up to the base from Zermatt, and you, can you see the attire I'm in there? It's a white shirt and tie. Now, who would wear that to the base of the Matterhorn? Well, only a missionary who hadn't been released yet. My dad took this picture, but I can remember as I sat there and stared up at that beautiful mountain thinking, remembering what John Goddard had taught and thinking, I'm going to stand on that mountain one day, on the summit. Now, fast forward 18 years, 1995, and I'd worked hard to get myself in great shape, and I'd studied a lot about mountaineering, uh, and Rosie and I took a trip to Zermatt. My goal was to climb that mountain and stand on the summit. And I hired a guide. I am not a good climber, but I was in good enough shape to do this. I hired a great guide who knew what he was doing, and we started early one morning up that mountain. We went right up that ridge, which is in the middle of the picture. <clears throat> now, the Matterhorn is one of the deadliest mountains in the world. And as I was climbing, this was a harrowing experience for me because you go up that ridge and you look either side and there are drops of thousands of feet and one misstep could be your last. You'll also be climbing along and there, there are places where they have crosses uh, that mark where somebody had lost his life. Well, we made it to the summit, and here's my guide and I on the summit, but you're only halfway when you get to the top of the mountain because more accidents happen on the descent than on the ascent. People are tired, they're not, they're not uh, thinking as clearly, uh, and so you have accidents, but finally I made it down. I love this picture with Rosie at, uh, on, uh, at the bottom of the mountain when I'd come down, and I can remember telling her, I'm never doing something like that again. <laughs> now, in the heat of the moment, we sometimes make statements that we take back, and it just took me a day or two to realize that that was just the beginning of adventures. Now, let me tell you that there are some <clears throat> goals that I set that I never achieved, just like John Goddard had some that he never achieved. Uh, he never made it to the moon. There were some others. Well, one of the goals I had, in fact, the biggest goal I had when John Goddard came to Logan High was to be a great basketball player. And I worked hard to do that, but this picture will show you one of the reasons why I never became a great basketball player. This is a jump shot. Can you see how far my feet are off the floor? This was when my best of days and I could get up about that high on a jump shot. In addition, I was slow. Other than that, I was not a bad basketball player. But I never achieved that goal. However, in pursuing it, I learned some great lessons. I learned about teamwork. I learned what it meant to work hard, to stay focused, to work with a group of people. It was a wonderful lesson for me. Now, let me go to some goals that really matter. On January 1st, 1987, I made a goal that I was going to read at least a chapter of the scriptures every day that year. I did that, and I've done it every day since. So over 32 years, 11,776 days. And my life has been richly blessed because I was in the scriptures every day. There have been numerous times when I have felt uh, I have received some wisdom or some strength as I've dealt with challenges at work, at home, at church. And I know that's in large part, that in large part comes from being in the scriptures, studying the word of God, every day. I made a goal to get married in the temple, and I made that well in advance of that event happening, and here's uh, on August 18th, 1978, Rosie and I were married in the Salt Lake Temple. Now, I, I appreciate that you didn't make any comments about my shorts 
on the, when, on the basketball shot, and that you don't make any about my hair on this picture in the, in the temple. But that temple marriage, again, has changed everything for us. And you got a flavor for who Sister Johnson is, and I'm the luckiest person in the world to have her as my eternal companion. I made a goal that I wanted to retire early and wanted to be able to do some things, have some freedom and do some things that I couldn't do in the corporate world. And so 10 years ago, we made this conscious decision that we were going to give up the income that came from working to get the freedom we'd have if we, when we retired. And so we did that. And Rosie and I had some great years where we had freedom to go and do pretty much what we wanted. And then we got a call from President Irene's secretary. And she said she wanted us to come in and meet in his office. And we went there and he called me to serve as a mission president and Rosie as my companion on that call. When he made, extended that call, I knew what that meant, that the next three years we would have neither freedom or income. <laughs> I appreciate what uh, Elder Hallstrom of the 70s said about mission presidents. He said, mission presidents give new meaning to the old primary song, I belong to the church of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Now, there was never any question what our response would be when we received that call because Rosie and I both set a goal that we would live the covenants that we made. And one of those covenants was to live the law of consecration, which meant we would give all that we had to build the kingdom of God. And we were blessed immeasurably during those three years we served in Pennsylvania. I love this quote from Elder Neil A. Maxwell, a former member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He said, if you have not chosen the kingdom of God as your goal in life, it will in the end make no difference what you choose instead. This is my nephew, Aaron Thatcher. And from the time Aaron was a very young boy, it was obvious that this was an exceptional young man. He knew the difference between right and wrong, and he was given all kinds of gifts. When he got to be a senior in high school, he was six feet seven inches tall. He had a wingspan of seven feet three inches. He was an incredible athlete. He could jump. He was fast. He was strong. He was quick was a great basketball player, was, an, was All-State three times, uh, could have played at virtually any college program in the country, but his real love in sports was baseball, and he was a pitcher. Now remember, he's six feet seven inches tall, he's left-handed, and he could throw a fastball over, well over 90 miles an hour. And that was not his best pitch. His best pitch was his curveball, which was almost unhittable. Well, when Aaron was a senior in high school, he was the player of the year in Utah. He was the best prospect that they had in years to come out of Utah. And uh, the major league scouts all wanted to sign him, draft him, and sign him to play for their teams. Elder David B. Haight talked about Aaron in the October 1993 General Conference, and I want you to watch just this very short clip. Aaron Thatcher, a young man with a love for baseball. Aaron had had many baseball scouts observe his unique talents, but he told them repeatedly that he would not sign a professional contract until after he had fulfilled his obligations to the Lord by serving a two-year mission. How could a young man turn down such an offer, people ask, but he did. His desire to serve the Lord was greater than his desire for instant fame. Aaron explained, 
I'm going on this mission not because my dad went. I'm going because I have a testimony of the gospel and the prophets have told us that every worthy and healthy young man should serve a full-time mission. I want to go with all of my heart, he said. Brothers and sisters. Well, Aaron was committed to go on a mission. The baseball scouts didn't believe him, and they wanted to draft him. Uh, the Baltimore Orioles had the fourth pick in the draft that year. They sat down with Aaron and said, let's talk about commitment. They said, if you will commit to forego your mission and focus on baseball, we'll use our pick, the fourth in the draft that year, and select you. We'll, the, that meant a signing bonus of about a million dollars that year. And it also meant that he would be picked two slots ahead of a young man named Derek Jeter who went on to have a pretty good career with the New York Yankees. Aaron was not swayed and made it clear that he was going to serve a mission. That meant that he was drafted later. He ended up being drafted in the fifth round by the Minnesota Twins. But Aaron never wavered in his commitment, never questioned whether or not the right thing was to go on a mission. And he served in the Sao Paulo mission, in uh, one of the Sao Paulo missions in Brazil. He was a great missionary. His mission president told a story about how he went to, he sent him to go talk to some school kids about being a professional athlete. Aaron wore his twins uniform and talked for a few minutes about that. And then he took his uniform off, had his white shirt, tie, and name tag on, and talked about that uniform as a missionary and how the most important thing he could be doing was to serve the Lord and be a representative of Jesus Christ. Well, Aaron came home, and I had my eyes on a new mountain, the Mount Kilimanjaro in Africa. This is the highest mountain in Africa. It's over 19,300 feet. It's the tallest uh, freestanding mountain in the world. Uh, there are taller mountains, but they're all part of a range. And Kilimanjaro is just out in the middle of the African plain and, and shoots up. Well, one Aaron's older brother, Jeff, had served a mission in Kenya, and I enlisted him, Aaron, and my oldest son, Stephen, to join me on this adventure. And here we are at the base of, of Kilimanjaro. This is not an easy climb. Anytime you get above 15,000 feet, now the Matterhorn's only 14,700 feet, a little more rugged than, than Kilimanjaro, but we're going another 5,000 feet, and that presents all kinds of challenges. But we set that goal, all four of us, and we ended up making it to the summit. Love this picture with the four of us and our guide. Aaron came home, <clears throat> and it took him a few years, but he found his lovely Lorraine. And the two of them were married in the Logan Temple. And quickly, they started a family, had their first two daughters. Uh, there couldn't be more devoted parents. And both of their first two daughters and their fourth child have cystic fibrosis. Now, CF is a challenge. It's a mean disease that requires daily maintenance and lots of help to stay on top of it. Aaron and Lorraine never complained about that challenge in their lives. And they have these beautiful, wonderful children. They ended up having six children. And Aaron was a great success in everything he did, in his profession, in his family life, in wherever he was called to serve in the church. He was an absolute model. Four years ago, my sister Kathy, Aaron's mother, gave me a call. We were in Pennsylvania. It was our first year serving there. And she said, Aaron is very gravely sick. She said he can hardly breathe. This great, strong athlete could hardly breathe. And they put him through a battery of tests and found that he had stage four cancer in his lungs, in his back, and in his brain. And they gave him 
just a couple of months to live. Well, with some great help from his, uh, from his, uh, I got ahead of myself, from his brother Jeff and some of the best cancer institutes in the world, Aaron got found a drug that extended his life and when that one lost its effectiveness, they found another one. And when we got home in 2017, we had a great reunion with Aaron. Now he continued this battle with cancer. And I love this picture. It's, it shows the ravages that cancer took to Aaron. But look in his eyes and you can see and you can feel the peace he had. That he knew that he had done what the Lord had asked him to do. And he was going to leave Lorraine and these six children. But he had done everything he could. And to the very day he died, he was at peace with his fate in life. And he knew he would go and meet his maker. But he could do it with all, all faith that he had met what he'd been asked to do in this life. And in uh, December, this past December, Aaron lost that battle with cancer. But he had always remembered this counsel from Elder Maxwell. He always chose the kingdom of God. Despite all the great things that Aaron did and could do, he was always focused on the kingdom of God. Now, let me take you back to where I began with John Goddard. In 1995, I was reading Chicken Soup, the first book in the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And in that book, they featured John Goddard and his life list. In the back of the book, they had John Goddard's address. And I sat down and wrote him a letter and thanked him for what he had done decades before and the lessons he taught me and inspired me. John wrote back and started a fast friendship. And a couple of years later, in 1997, he called me and he said, hey, I want to invite you to a, uh, a hike I'm going to do with some friends in the foothills uh, outside of Los Angeles where John lived. And Rosie and I were living in Wisconsin at the time, but I said, I'm going. I get a chance to meet John face to face. This will be a great experience. Now, Aaron happened to be in Southern California at the time. He just had some shoulder surgery and he was rehabbing in Southern California where the twins had sent him. And by the way, that sh those shoulder injuries kept him from ever pitching in the major leagues. And so I called John and I said, John, would it be okay if Aaron joined us? And he said, oh, we'd be very welcome. Let's do that. And Aaron was elated because when Aaron was in school, John Goddard had done an assembly at his school. Aaron had been inspired by John's message and John was one of Aaron's heroes. So we got this chance <clears throat> to meet John, and spend a day with him. I love this picture that was taken on a better day, a day when all three of us were in great health. And John Goddard passed away six years ago, and Aaron's been gone four months now. But I am thankful for those two men, for John, for his his message, his example in life of what we can do if we're willing to dream big and go for goals. And for Aaron, for this young man who chose every step along the way to remember what the priorities in life should be. With all the gifts he'd been given, he used those gifts to help build the kingdom of God. Now I hope and I pray that each one of you will think about what your goals are. 
that you'll go home and make a life list, just as John Goddard did when he was 15 years old, a few years younger than most of you. Go home and think about what you want to accomplish in life. Make that list. And again, dream big. Be committed to do those goals, and you'll accomplish great things. But as you do that, I hope you never forget this counsel from Elder Maxwell, that if you haven't chosen the kingdom of God as your goal in life, it will, in the end, make no difference what you choose instead. To that truth, I testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.